stop. Stop right there. Do not go to the comment section. Do not click the little comment section bubble. Do not start ferociously typing into that comment section bubble thing. And do not press enter. I know everybody loves Crytag. Everybody absolutely loves these things so much. And they should. These are fantastic guns. They're just very well built, very well designed. And I'd say it's probably the best AEG on the market. The best electronic gun on the market is probably Sistema. Yeah, you know, a little bit there. But the best AEG in the market is Crytac. Anyway, this video is in response to gun gamers. The guy over there made a really good video on what is wrong with Crytac and everything wrong with Crytac in general. He lists a couple complaints and says, you know, what he thinks on it and all that stuff. And he makes a really, he makes some really, really good points. And so I thought I'd make a response to him and what I believe everything wrong with Crytac is. So in his video, he has a couple bullet points, basically, of what he thinks is wrong with Crytac. And these things are very small things. They're very minor. They're not huge at all. They're, you know, like I said, minor. They're nothing kind of issues, I guess you could say. But they're still issues, and he suggests that we should still be able to critique things that are really good to make them even better. I completely agree. That's pretty much why my channel exists, actually. Because I critique things, and I tech on things to make them better than what they are. So... I am making a response to each of his bullet points and then suggesting my own things. So, here we go. Everything wrong with Crytac. So the very first thing that he says is wrong with Crytac is the fact that the receivers are always breaking right here. Now, what he suggests the problem here is, is that the buffer tube screw just sits in the receiver, the lower receiver, it tightens in the receiver, and not the gearbox shell itself. And he says that this adds an extra layer of support, and it's why Crytax receivers break and other receivers don't. Now, I don't think that's actually true because one of the reasons, well, one of the main reasons why I think it's not true is simply because in VFC, their HK416 gun that they have, the receiver does the same thing. The buffer tube screw just screws into the back of the receiver, if I remember correctly. At least it was that like that on the M27 IAR uh, made by VFC. It's screwed into the receiver and not into the gearbox shell. And they never had any issues with bro broken receivers that I know of. Now, he could still be right, that could still play a role, but I don't think it plays as big as a role as what he is laying it out to be. So, I think the receiver breaking is actually kind of poor QC. It's unlikely that it's poor material quality, but more or less poor quality control. Where, but what I mean by that is like one in every 500 units is prone to breaking, or one in every 1,000. I don't know the actual statistic, but I don't think it's actually related to the um, receiver materials. I think it's more related to quality control. Though, I could be completely wrong, but I think quality control is the most likely reason why those receivers break. The second issue that he lays out is an issue with the MOSFET. Now he says that Crytac only recommends 11 one volt LiPo up to 15 C discharge for that build or for their guns with their built-in MOSFETs. Now Crytac may say they recommend only that much and Gun Gamers says that, you know, it's really hard to find a 15 C LiPo battery, you know, because most of them are actually beyond that. The truth of the matter is that that MOSFET isn't going to break because you go to a 25C battery. I've actually taken out the Crytac MOSFETs, you know, out of the Crytac gun because when I install like a Spectre into a customer gun, I get to keep the Crytac MOSFET because I get to keep the parts I replace. So I have this Crytac MOSFET and I've been actually able to put that inside of another build, like say a single sector gear SCAR build like I've done before, or a DSG build in the M4 that I've done before. And both times, that MOSFET is easily ran, a 70 discharge LiPo battery, with absolutely, any, with absolutely no issues at all. So to be completely honest, the MOSFET can easily handle more than a 15 C and 1 volt discharge battery, but Crytac does that to have some sort of you know, limit for their warranty, so that if you break it out on, say, a 90 C discharge battery, they'll say, well, it shouldn't have been on that battery, and we can't cover it on the warranty. It's just an easy way for them to kind of get around warranty issues. That's why I think that that is there for. Also, Gun Gamers brings up another point that whenever he sees people having a 25C or 30C or 40C discharge battery on their stock Crytax, he'll see like he'll see double shooting. Now, I'm not I'm not sure if he's implying that this double shooting relates to the MOSFET or not. I'm not exactly sure what he's implying here, but I got the feeling he was saying that the MOSFET, whenever you go above that 15C limit 
that it actually causes your gun to have double shot, or double cycling is what it's called. Um, this isn't the case, because this MOSFET is a 3034 based MOSFET. It doesn't have active braking, it doesn't have anything like that, it just protects your trigger contacts and dumps all that energy in the battery directly into the motor, as opposed to going to the trigger contacts and then the motor, like the traditional AEG does. The reason why this MOSFET can't actually cause overspin on a higher seed discharge battery is because it has nothing to do with actual cutoff time. It only has anything to do with, you know, sustaining that energy and putting it into the motor as opposed to routing it through the trigger contacts. That's all it does. The MOSFET in this gun only acts as a gate. That is it. It doesn't have anything to do with cutoff timing. It doesn't have anything to do with double cycling. Likely what the double cycling issue is is a cutoff timing issue. Sometimes with Crytag guns they just cut off a bit later than say, I don't know, a VFC gun. And so what tends to happen is you get double shot. That's just and a severe amount of overspin, basically. To fix this, you can put in a higher TPA motor, you can fix the trigger, the trigger system and the cutoff system to where the cutoff uh, timing is you know, sooner in the cycle as opposed to later. Yeah, but it's, it's not related to the MOSFET at all, because this MOSFET isn't active braking, it's nothing like that. But if you had an active braking MOSFET, and it was causing double shot, that would be really weird, and that would definitely be the MOSFET's fault. More than likely, that is. The next thing that Gun Gamers goes over is the absence of a sector delay chip on the Crytac gun. Now, I completely agree with him here, 100%. The lack of a sector delay chip is ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would, would Crytac just not put one there? That doesn't make any sense to me at all. I would immediately put a sector delay chip on it just because it helps feeding, especially on those higher voltage batteries like 11 volt LiPo batteries. So, it just makes a lot of sense to put a sector delay chip on there. The very first Crytac I ever had, ever worked on at all, I mean I don't own any Crytacs, but I've worked on dozens of them, and the very first Crytac I ever worked on wouldn't feed at all. On semi, on a 7.4 volt, on a full auto on a 7.4 volt, it didn't matter what battery I was running on or what trigger or, or what you know fire selection mode I was on. The gun would not cycle or would not feed a BB at all, and it was absolutely infuriating. So I took the gun apart, put it in a sector delay chip, and it fed absolutely fine. It's pretty darn ridiculous. So I definitely recommend that Crytac put a sector, de sector delay chip on there just because feeding issues are a huge pain in the butt and nobody wants to get a gun right out of the box, put some BBs in the bag and put them in the gun and then it just not shoot. That's pretty insane to me, but maybe I got a dud. I don't know. The next thing Gun Gamers talks about is the body pins. Now, I don't particularly care about what type of body pins I'm running as long as they stay in. Gun Gamers doesn't like the uh, hex body pins, and yeah, that can be a huge pain, especially this one right here, because this one over here is okay because the pin locks, because it, it's in a D shape. So it locks, it can't rotate all the way when you try to unscrew it. However, on this side, where the body pin is just a circle, you know, a cylinder, it can rotate if it's too tight, meaning that the body pin can be so tight on itself and not the receiver to make it to where you can't even undo the body pin. So I do see a point there. Um, I, I, I guess I guess when it came down, if it comes down to it, I would prefer the ones that just slide in and slide out by friction. But I don't see too much of an issue here. This one's this one's an ex extreme nitpick in my opinion. But yeah, I'll give it to him. It definitely, I guess in the end, you would want something that slides in and slides out to avoid issues like this. So the final issue he talks about is the Crytax use of so much thread lock that it is insane. Um, yeah, Crytac uses obsessive amounts of thread lock. There's, but yeah, I had such difficulty on un just undoing the gearbox shell, opening up the gearbox shell in this gun, that I, I stripped two screws, I had to screw them out, and I just used the two Spectre screws that I got in a Spectre MOSFET that I installed in this. So thank God for Spectre MOSFETs and, and, B and BTC. But uh, Crytac uses so much thread lock that it is absolutely ridiculous. Like. And it's not even like Tokyo Murray thread lock or SEMA thread lock where it comes undone pretty easily. No, it's this hardcore blue rock solid thread lock that will not come undone no matter what. And so, well not no matter what because I did get them undone. But uh, what I do sometimes when I have this issue is I just take some heat and I apply it to that screw and then after a couple minutes, maybe one or two of applying that heat, the thread lock will heat up enough to where I can unscrew the screw. So if uh, Gun Gamers is watching this sometime later on in his life, I don't know, then maybe he can take that advice and run with it whenever he takes part in the cry attack because it definitely helped me from stripping 
nine other screws. So in the end of his video, he actually suggests, you know, a stronger MOSFET and a potential micro switch. Now, I'm actually against the micro switch, and the reason why I'm against a micro switch is because though micro switches work well when combined with a MOSFET, they result in pretty snappy trigger response, pretty good trigger reset time, and all kinds of other issues like or in all kinds of other good pluses like that. I don't particularly like micro switches because whenever you add a micro switch into a gearbox shell, what you're doing is you're kind of having to design your own gearbox shell trigger setup, and what this does is it prevents you from installing a Spectre MOSFET or a um, a Titan MOSFET or a Chimera MOSFET. So I don't really like micro switches just because of that reason. Alright, so now on to my own critiques. I bet you guys have been looking forward to this part when I actually tear apart one of everybody's favorite guns. Um, anyway, one of my biggest issues with this gun, and there aren't very many, but one of my biggest issues with this gun is whenever I take apart a Crytac, a customer wants me to install a Spectre or a Titan. And I love both those MOSFET pieces because they're fantastic pieces of work. But the biggest issue is is that I have to use my Dremel for about an hour and a half to actually carve out the space needed to install a Spectre. For some reason, Crytac has a bunch of just stuff everywhere where the trigger is. So, like, they have an extra metal here, and then they've got an extra amount of metal here. And then on the top of the shell, on the other side, they've got a bunch of metal here, so you have to, you know, uh, Dremel that, that down too to install any of these types of really cool MOSFETs. So, I would really recommend that Crytac look into how JG has designed their gearboxes and like GMP and VFC and just get rid of that extra reinforcement around the trigger area. It's completely unnecessary. It's just, I don't even know what it does in Crytan guns. It just sits there. That's it. It's kind of like when there's reinforcement around the, the spur gear on the top portion of the shell. It doesn't make any sense at all. It should just be gone. It makes it a huge pain in the butt to stall 13 to 1, 12 to 1, sometimes even 16 to 1 gears just because the tolerance is so tight there. So that's definitely one critique for Crytac. They should definitely get rid of that reinforcement around the trigger area because everybody wants to install a Spectre or a Titan or a Chimera nowadays. And that added reinforcement really makes it hard for techs to actually install these MOSFETs in these guns. So my second issue with Crytac is something that people, a lot of people are probably going to disagree with me on, but it's something that I, with my, with my technical experience working on these guns for five years, kind of know a little bit more about than most people. No offense. Um, and some techs out there will probably agree with me on this. I do not like rotary-based hop-up units. It's quite simple. The way they design rotary-based hop-up units, every single rotary-based hop-up unit I've ever seen except ICS does this. It's a huge pain in the butt. But the way they design rotary hop-up units is they have this rotational wheel that we all know about. And as the, as the wheel rotates, there's a track. And this track, the hop-up arm is on. And this track progressively gets tighter to where it applies more and more pressure on that bucking. And the reason why I don't like this is look at the concept that you have here. As the rotary wheel gets tighter, it does this, like a seesaw. Look at the angle that you're producing when you press down the hop-up bucking. You're producing a really sharp angle, and that I'm not a big fan of. What, what this creates is kind of a kind of like a, a point to a mountain, kind of like a pinnacle in reverse, like a uh, stalagmite, I guess, or whatever it is coming from the ceiling. Um, but it, it comes to a point, and it doesn't come to a nice rounded edge, or it doesn't come to a nice block. It comes to a point. And the reason why I don't like this is because, you know, small points or sharp points in the hop-up unit isn't a good idea, because what that does is it creates inconsistencies, especially between in full auto fire. It kind of gets a, a odd spread, or it'll curve to one side or the other, because that sharp point that's coming down on the BB it's such a finite area that if it's off to one side a little bit or off to the other side a little bit, it'll throw it one way or the other, but I guarantee you it's going to cause a spread at a distance, and I don't like that at all. The easy way to fix this is to do something that ICS has done, where they have the rotary wheel. I know why people like the rotary wheel. Easy to adjust, and it stays where you put it. I, I like both those things, but I don't like the angle. So what ICS does is as it progressively gets tighter, they have a system where it presses straight down as opposed to kind of like a seesaw. So when it presses straight down, what it does is it applies hop-up pressure to the bucking on, at an even level all across the hop-up window. So you're taking advantage of maximum contact surface. Think of it like this. The more contact surface you have for the bucking to the BB, the more accurate and the more consistent your shots are going to be. The less contact, the less accurate and the less consistent your shots are going to be. It's just plain and simple. That's why I don't like rotary design hop-up units 90% of the time, because 
almost all of them, have this seesaw design as opposed to a straight down concept. So I, I, I would love to see them do that straight down concept because that would show that they're really thinking or really listening to the community. So my last critique of, of Crytac in general is their use of springs in the hop-up chamber to press it against the gearbox shell. Now I made a video about this a couple of days ago where I talked about how springs in the hop-up chamber can actually cause an issue with air seal because what they do is they become kind of unreliable, they're a little inconsistent, they shake around and don't allow for actual force against the gearbox shell. So what I recommend as a fix to this is using o-rings or other forms of spacers to press the hop-up chamber against the gearbox shell. This is quite simple. All you do is take O-rings, put them down the barrel, right in front of the hop-up chamber, and it presses right up. It press the O-rings press against the uh, hop-up area chamber, the hop-up chamber's chamber, and press it directly into the gearbox shell. And this just works so much better. I do it on all my DSGs, DMRs, and high-speed builds. I even do it on every gun that I possibly can. I run out of these O-rings really quick, but it's definitely a good fix for reliability issues. So this video wasn't supposed to be some sort of jab at uh, gun gamers. It was more or less an addition and kind of my thoughts on his video and idea. Like I said, I think he's a pretty smart guy. I think he really has good suggestions on Crytac. I just wanted to throw in my two cents and I guess you could say my proverbial hat into the opinions just to kind of add to the mix. That's all. Also, if you haven't subscribed to him, you should subscribe to him. As usual, guys, be sure to leave a like comment, tell me what you thought of this video, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up, if you hated it and you thought it sucked, give it a thumbs down, and tell me why I like to make improvements on my videos, so, or on my videos, so I'm having some sort of progression towards greatness of some sort, so tell me what you thought below. Anyway, I will see you guys in the next video of whatever the heck I do, until then, stay tuned, Dex.